Hey, welcome to the Ron Johnson Discipleship Podcast. We're so glad you tuned in this week. We're always excited to be with you. We love your feedback as we continue to help bring some moral clarity in a culture that is full of all kinds of confusion right now. Uh, and, you know, we've talked about this. Uh, it's kind of a brave new world out there where you wake up and the headlines each day cause you just to scratch your head and go, what in the world right. is going on? And how are people coming to these kind of conclusions? And and we're put, putting forth what kind of legislation and what are we trying to teach our kids? And, I mean, it's just amazing how people are just stunned at the, uh, I guess, the uh, rapidity of the s- social change around us. Um, and today, as we get into it here shortly, we're going to answer a lot of questions for people because uh, really we're living in a world that is largely influenced by uh, a major theorist uh, yeah. who many folks are not familiar with, but but it will help bring clarity as to as to why things are so crazy. Today. Yeah, and I think it's, it's important for us to understand where we come from to see where the trend, or at least where the policymakers are going, and how we can stop it, and what are the opposing forces, what are counter-arguments, right. to kind of have a bird's eye view. Of Absolutely, and when you hear these things, or, or things put forth, or certain agendas driven by certain groups of people, all of a sudden you realize, oh, okay, I know what they're doing, I, I know why they think that way, because yeah. it's so foreign to our Christian worldview. Yeah. Yeah, we're getting the playbook, yeah, the enemy's playbook, exactly. basically. Yeah. And then you so, go, ah, that's where they're coming from. You guys are from. like, what are you guys talking about? <laughs> we'll get to specifics. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. We'll, we'll flesh yeah. this yeah, out. We'll flesh this out. Yeah. Um, but hey, even before we get into the, the uh, topic of today, we wanted to bring you up to speed on a lot of important things going on. You know, this Sunday, I, I was I was trumpeting this and the message on mm-hmm. Sunday, how important it is for Christians uh, who are in the marketplace, which is like everybody, especially those who are running businesses and have the, yeah. the power to implement a kingdom culture, Christian values, Christian principles into the marketplace. It's time really to rally together and to get some support and get a common vision. And that's what that's what really what market share is all about. So we got an exciting market share coming up yeah, Saturday morning. This Tell us coming about. Saturday at 8 o'clock. We're going to have breakfast fellowship together. This is where we get to hang out, get to know each other, get to know... Um, what are uh, what kind of gifts and you know, businesses you're a part of or you own or, or whatnot? But we're talking about an important topic. Talking, we're talking about how do you how do you normalize a feedback culture? Feedback culture is the key to getting better. Yeah. And we often see feedback as something that's negative or contentious. It doesn't have to be that way. Uh, having a great feedback culture is a kingdom culture. And this is so important for, for us in the marketplace because, you know, all the stuff we're talking about here is basically someone laying out their principles for their kingdom that they're building. And when we get to be in the marketplace, whether you're a business owner or you're just a leader or whatever territory dominion, you could be a frontline worker, you are you have given the opportunity of stewardship to lay out God's kingdom in whatever dominion you do that's have. Good. And that's why it's so important for us in the workplace in the marketplace to think through and say how can i bring god's glory to counter everything because everyone else is bringing their kingdom are we as christians bringing god's kingdom to it what we do every day right that's good and the whole whole posture of humility that simply says uh, i don't know it all i need feedback i have blind spots i i i I welcome your input in my life because i know you you know if you're coming and say pastor i really need to talk to you about that message on sunday (laughs) i'm not gonna go what do you mean by that i mean because i know you love me you you value me and i know that whatever you're going to share is going to be important it's an important perspective but many people don't view it that way and it's it's a threat when you start right speaking into my life positioning yourself to normalize feedback in your culture is such a kingdom principle because you're saying ultimately i am not god i am not the king god is the king and god used people yeah. Especially trusted people or people in my leadership team, people who are who are surrounding my life, who I love and know me, to give me feedback so I can grow. That's it's, good. It's a, it's a kingdom posture. That's good. Yeah. So so they're going to get a bagel and great <laughs> feedback and great fellowship. Yes, absolutely. Eight o'clock. Eight o'clock. Come on out to the Little Church. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. Yes. yes, and I set a record on Sunday. I, I'm, I'm so proud of myself. Uh, I set a record for the sh- shortest sermon series title oh, yeah. in the history of Pastor Ron Johnson Jr.'s preaching. Yeah, it's on par with the Jesus verse, I wept, you know. Yeah. It's, 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 on it's par shorter with that. than that. It's shorter than that, yeah. It's simply called me, but... But, but it, the subtitle makes it In Jonathan it. Edwards style, yeah. I, I do have a big <laughs> subtitle. But I think it's a good subtitle. It's called um, finding, a, uh, finding Your Real Identity in a Culture of Self-Deception. Yeah. And, and it really piggybacks on this. This, of course, is we're diving into a, um, a, a cultural, you know, treatment of... of of uh, how we got to where we are today, but it, but it deals with philosophy and psychology and those types of things. Whereas on Sunday morning, we're really focusing on 
the theological aspects of who we are, yeah. uh, where we find our identity, and really how we live the best life. Yeah. Uh, and so I really encourage people. We, we started the series on Sunday with our opening volley, got a lot of great feedback because we're really speaking to all kinds of issues that people are confronted with every single day and in an increasing manner yeah. in the marketplace. Absolutely. And so I encourage you to, to tune into that if you miss Sunday and, and kind of get caught up. Um, we're talking today in our, in our uh, ongoing uh, covering of this book, Strange New World. The topic was called Sexualizing Psychology, Politicizing Sex. And I think everybody can relate today. Like you wake up, you're trying to raise your family, and you realize, why in the world am I bombarded with sexual images and thoughts and messaging 24-7, around the clock, and even, you know, to our kids, it's like you go, wait a minute, how did this planet get so sexualized? This is not the way, like I talked to my parents, um, they were raised in the 50s, uh, and they were like, man, this it wasn't like this at all. Uh, it was so wholesome, it was, you know, you can go out and play, uh, you weren't worried about your kids, you can watch whatever, uh, you know, it just, and now it's it's completely sexualized, and from our worldview, we just, we step back and we go, how could something so intimate, an act so intimate, reserved between a man and a woman in the most intimate setting, and the most yeah. intimate expression, become so public? Yeah. And, uh, and we're going to try to answer that question today. But talk about the shift between, uh, again, sex as a behavior and sex as an identity, because that, that's, this is a fundamental, profound shift that we are, are confronting today. And I think that's the problem we most of us don't understand because we subtly it's a subtle shift from behavior to identity so we used to say oh they're they, they're going to have sex that means they're going to engage in a physical activity yeah it's something you do right but throughout the cultural trends through the sneakiness of ideology they sneak in through commercials and movies and policies and whatnot and changing languages and change, yeah. changing we see a lot of that around here right? definition of recession um, right. <laughs> everything's being changed the definition is being changed next thing you know like it's like out of nowhere all of a sudden your your sexual preferences your sexual uh, desires becomes part of your deepest sense of who you are your identity so for us to yeah. say hey it's wrong to behave and such and such way sexually based on a, a, a biblical morality yep. is now viewed as bigotry because really what that's being interpreted as is you're attacking me, you're attacking my identity when we're saying, no, we're not attacking your identity, we're attacking your behavior. Right. What you're doing is wrong before the Lord. Right. And then people today say, well, I can't be separated from my identity right. and my behavior cannot be separated. That's, that's right. a massive shift in how we used to view people, selfhood, identity, and certainly sexuality. And we were just talking about this earlier before the podcast, you know, when, when someone makes a statement like, I'm a heterosexual. Even that phrase, that I am a heterosexual, or he is a homosexual, or whatever it is, you, we're, we're buying to that language of it. Instead of saying, I practice this, or right. or, or that's my behavior. When you, when you identif I identify as a heterosexual, when you make that statement, you're tying to sexual behaviors into your identity. Right. So unknowingly, we all just buy into that language, that, that world, by our verbiage, by these words that's been created. Right, and we right? caution people, you know, on Sunday, you got to watch the language that we use because when we pick up the vernacular of a worldview that is diametrically opposed to Christianity, you're buying into those assumptions without even knowing it. And so much of the language today, like my, my daughter was talking about how she was uh, sharing with a Christian friend at a Christian college and the girl was kind of, you know, she was wishy-washy on, on her understanding of, of uh, sexu biblical sexuality. She has a friend who's gay. And so she loves her friend, and her friend is gay. And so, uh, and as Caroline and I were talking about this, uh, we said, here's, here's the problem. Gay is an identity. Gay says, this is who I am. This is how I was born. That's not a biblical construct at all. So we have to attack the, even the words that we use because they're not coming from a biblical understanding. They're actually coming from a so very secularized, godless understanding to where gay becomes the way you are or the, may, the way God even made you is the way some people refer to yeah. it. And, uh, and it's just simply not lining up with biblical language at all. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what causes part of the confusion. So we're going to talk about today a major thinker, a major philosopher who is still shaping, probably shaping American culture more than any other philosopher. We talked about Rousseau, we talked about Nietzsche, we talked about Marx. All of these are big players in today's yeah. culture. 
but Sigmund Freud uh, is is alive and well everywhere in America. And uh, we're going to talk about a couple major ideas that he introduced that help us understand why we are where we are today. The first one is this. He believed that sex was foundational to human happiness. Talk about the, the logic there. So everybody, everybody lives to pursue pleasure or happiness and to avoid pain. I mean, you, you got to be a sick person to be yeah. pursuing pain, right? So we, I think we could all agree we all want to be happy. And there's nothing the matter with that. Uh, you know, everybody wants to be happy. I think the question is, how does one find happiness? And that's what Freud was yeah. trying to talk about. Yeah, I think the book talks about Thomas Jefferson, even in the Declaration of Independence, wrote, you know, life, life liberty, liberty, and the pursuit, pursuit of happiness. So yep. life, liberty, these are intrinsic rights, identity rights, God-given rights that, God, that, that, that we've been given by God, which the government is supposed to protect, right? So this is where the government and the sure. politicians comes in. Life, <clears throat> uh, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But then, then they, they draw on that. So identity now is tied into your happiness or pursuit of happiness. What is happiness? Well, Freud then connects that pursuit of happiness to ulti ultimate happiness to sexual pleasure. Right. Purely like sexual, like, like actual the action of sex. Like carnal <laughs> Pursu oh. Gen genital eroticism. Yeah, is that's what, what he, he says. That's so, what he says. Yeah. So, so the happy person will be the sexually fulfilled person. So, the more sex you're having for Freud, the the, yep. the more fulfilled and happy you're going to be. Now, this is an important uh, issue to talk about because you have to ask the question: Well, what does the Bible teach about that? Um, and, you know, does the Bible encourage us to find happiness and pleasure? And I would say yes. Yep. But the difference is, what is going to bring you lasting happiness and lasting pleasure? How about this? What, what's going to bring you the maximum amount of pleasure eternally? Yeah. And you and I talked about this as it relates, for instance, to, to say, marriage. Uh, so, you know, you're dissatisfied with your wife, you're frustrated, things aren't clicking, the, the bedroom's gone cold, and all of a sudden you fall into a trap and you have a, a one-night stand with, with somebody at work, and so momentarily, you're happy because you're fulfilling your your identity, which is to be a sexual person. Right? to for it, yeah. And, and and yet you're going to go home, and your marriage is going to blow up, and your family's going to blow up, and your children are going to be uh, living in a home now uh, that's been broken. And so you ask the question: Was that one night stand? seeking sexual gratification, you know, uh, genital uh, uh, eroticism. How did that work out for you in the long term? And then we haven't even talked about eternity. Of course, Freud didn't believe in, in God. Freud was not a, a, a Bible-embracing person. Freud did not believe in eternal life. Yeah. You know, so none of those things mattered in his theory. But right. we talked about, you know, pleasure is important. The Bible says, you know, at, at, the, at the Lord's right hand is pleasure forevermore. Yeah. So we should be seeking maximum pleasure as believers but not er erotic pleasure, but life pleasure, total pleasure in pleasing the Lord, which has been the basic Christian right. value is we live not for sexual pleasure, but we live for the glory of God. And yeah. certainly that includes, you know, in a, in a marital life, that includes sexual pleasure. There's nothing wrong with it, sexual it's, pleasure. It, biblically, it's a component of your overall pleasure, the sexual pleasure in a confined, restrained way within marriage and because there's so many factors that ties into pleasure. Like... Why not, if carnal pleasure is all you seek for, then take cocaine or heroin or whatever people, you know, that's right. what people do. That's what right. people fall into, right? But like you said, how, how long lasting is that pleasure when you're addicted to some, you know, lethal drug, right? Um, so the idea, again, the idea from Freud is like, to say ultimate pleasure is found in, in, in sexual expression is so short-sighted yeah. and so limiting. And it doesn't apply to real world life because how happy... Are people we minister to who you know had an affair or whatever, and now their their kids can't stand them, and their wives you know they're estranged and they're, they're yep. older, and just we see this brokenness all over, and we're like this world we doesn't work. But this is yeah. a this is a huge philosophical link because yeah. you go from Rousseau, which whom we talked about a few weeks ago, right. who basically said. Um, Self, individual self-expression is yeah. the way to happiness. Just be yourself. Be authentic. Uh, pursue the desires of your heart. Create yourself. Yeah. That that's a broader kind of picture. Freud narrows that down and basically says, no, yourself is sexual. 
uh, you are sexual right. at the core of who you are. And therefore, not to be able to fully express your sexuality is what uh, is harmful. Right. Uh, and that, that is America today. So Freud is all around us. He's screaming. And, and, and even that idea is ties into major industries. P pornography industries, you know, other industries, uh, whatever, uh, uh, sexual these uh, counselors, therapists, or whatever, and just well, drugs. We, how just... many of you have been sitting around watching television with your kids, and all of a sudden, an erectile dysfunction commercial <laughs> comes on? You know, yeah. and 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 you're talking about the little blue pill, and your kids going, "What is erectile dysfunction?" And you know, you're like, "Why am I? Why am I being hit with it?" Because here's what it is: it's it's we're pursuing. Perpetual sexual expression. It, it ties into this narrative. This is the joy. This is what the key to joy and pleasure and and a lasting, fulfilled, you know, perfect life is. All these different dimensions. So those are more and more open, more and more less boundaries and restraints because of Mr. Freud. Yeah, Mr. Freud. Yeah. Here's another thing where Mr. Freud is screaming. How many of you parents have been absolutely appalled? that we have school systems. In fact, this was the big thing uh, with the whole uh, don't say gay, which was, of course, a, a farcical campaign. Um, uh, when, when Florida and when Governor DeSantis basically passed legislation saying you're not going to be teaching uh, sexual content, sexualized curriculum, LGBT-driven ideology to our kindergartners in the state of Florida. Now, any parent in their right mind, at least if you're coming from a Christian worldview, you'd be saying, what business does this does public education have in teaching my kids about sexuality, let alone what business do they have teaching my kindergartner yeah. about, about LGBT ideology? Um, and uh, we're, we're appalled by these things. And then when you saw school boards being you know, brought to, to, to uh, account by parents and parents being attacked by the FBI, you know, as being terrorists, yeah. you're going, what is the matter? Or, or how about this fashionable craze today where we invite drag queens, uh, men dressed up like women, to come in and read storybooks uh, to children in public right. libraries? You're going, what kind of absolute perversion and craziness is taking place here. Like, why are we uh, are exposing our innocent children to sexual topics like this that are completely age inappropriate? So, what would be Freud's take on this? Because the reason all this is happening is Freud. Yeah. Well, he's thinking liberation. We want to liberate these kids so they can be sexually free and be able to express themselves, and because that's the core of who they are. This is li this. Yeah, well, it goes yeah. even like you're touching on here. It goes even deeper than that because what Freud's saying is. It's not just once you reach puberty that now all of a sudden sex becomes on the radar. Freud's saying that infants, from, from when they're born, uh, they are sexual creatures. He, he saw, for instance, a baby nursing that was sexual. Sucking your thumb, that's sexual. Uh, all kinds of str strange uh, uh, development processes taking place, all rooted in sexual identity. Again, much of this has been discredited, at least from a scientific standpoint. But this, for Freud, everything from the womb to the tomb was about sex. Mm. And so if that child is sexual, even as a, an infant, it is not uh, inappropriate uh, when they're in kindergarten to start talking to them about sexual things, because in Freud's mind, they're already sexual creatures. Yeah. And, and so, again, we look at this going, what is the problem? And Freud identified two problems in his day with public education. The first one was the, what he called the retardation of sexual uh, development in kids. In other words, we weren't talking about sex early enough and often enough with our kids. The second thing Freud said was a problem is the introduction of religious viewpoints in the curriculum too early in the life of these kids. Basically, that religion was something that was going to to mess them up. Yeah. Um, but let's talk about Freud's view of religion for a moment. You yeah. know, he, he used two, two I words to describe um, religion. Number one, infantile. What, what, what does he mean by infantile? Yeah, it's immature. It's a construct. It's for, no. You, you grow, yeah, yeah. mature people grow out of the need for right. it. You know, it, it's infantile. It's childish. The other I word was illusionary. Uh, so, you know, people em embrace all of these fa false and fake ideas about a God, about eternal life, about morality, um, but it's all illusionary. Uh, none of it's real. But interestingly enough, Freud saw 
a public, you know, I guess a positive side to religion. Uh, and in fact, he believed it, it had a necessary role in creating civilization, which is kind of strange. But talk a little bit about that. Help our listeners understand. Like, what was his view? He hated religion. He hated the church. He hated the Bible. He hated biblical morality. But in a strange way, he saw the need for it. Yeah, he... And I, I I don't fully understand this. I'm trying to comprehend his mind. Basically, he saw that the, the sexual drive is the essential nature of every person. But that drive without constraints can lead to destruction. Just go around and, pillaging and doing whatever they want. Yeah, raping, to, you know, to, whatever. Yeah. Uh, taking advantage of other people. Right. So, so strangely enough, he recognized that religion and morality that came important. from the Bible yeah. placed a, a harness on people and allowed us to have a civilized society where people weren't just running around raping and pillaging, as yeah. you said. Um, but that leaves people uh, with a sense just, of discontentment. Yeah, that's, that's his word, discontentment. So it's a trade-off. To be part of a civilized uh, civilization... You have to trade off some of your desires for morality, you know. And so and here you are, man. You're a young man, and all you think about is sex, and you want to have sex, and but you can't act on just your drives. And so now we're encouraging, hey, well, join a softball league, yeah. or, or go uh, work out, go work go out, go to church, or, yeah, 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 go to church or do something. In other words, right. the the whole purpose of all these other things was just simply to put a curb on your sexual appetite. Yeah. Now, it's interesting. I, yeah, I've been married now for 38 years. You're, you're a married man. Um, I just find that God's wired men and women differently. My wife is not sitting around 24-7 thinking about sexual activity, nor does, it, does virtually any woman on planet Earth, uh, is she wired that way. In other words, sex is not all-encompassing. Now, you talk to a 20-year-old guy, and he's probably thinking about sex a little bit more uh, uh, because that drive, is, again, is a godly drive. It is a, good, it is a good thing. But my point is there's even a difference. If I find it interesting, Freud has this theory as a man, but I don't know that I've ever seen a woman theorist that says all she thinks about all day long is, is sexual expression. Um, so it's even interesting they're looking at the genders. But nevertheless, Freud said, hey, you know, religion, it's an illusion, it's infantile, but it, it serves a purpose. It, it helps us at least have a society where everybody, where, where, where the, the, the biggest and the strongest guy is not running around with a harem, uh, you know, yeah. uh, using and abusing women. Right. Um, but anyway, it was a very dark view of, of uh, yeah. civilization. Existence, the tension point. There's always tension. There's so, always... so the reason Freud's office is full of people that he's counseling yeah. is because they're having a hard time dealing with managing their underlying uh, sexual drives. That's how he sees the world. That's, yeah, that's yeah. how he sees every problem. It's, it's sexually related, right? So, yeah, so we got, so yeah, I get it. You're right. sexually repressed. That's a problem. Uh, so you're dealing with guilt and shame. Let's, let's, let's free you from guilt and shame and, and, and find a better outlet for you to uh, sublimate your, uh, your neurotic desires for so, more sex. So even those words, sexual repression, comes from Freud. Oh, right? yeah. Which, absolutely. again, we hear those terms all the time, right? Yep. And, and, yeah. Or this, yeah. you know, we talked about this in the message on Sunday. I get so sick and tired. Every time you disagree with somebody, they call you some phobe. You're a homophobe. You're an Islamophobe. You're you're a, a transphobe. I mean, there's all, whatever you disagree with somebody else's position, you get phobe put on the end of a word. Well, that's Freudian. Freud was all about phobias. Uh, in other words, these were irrational fears that people had that many times they weren't, mm. there was at the subconscious level, right? So even the idea of the subconscious, we hear this talked about a lot, mm. uh, a Freudian slip, right? Mm -hmm. You say something, oh, it didn't really mean to say it. All of this comes from Freud's psychoanalytic theory. Yeah, you're saying there's a repressed level that you don't, you're not really aware of, and... And the, those ignorance or those fears, repressed fear of the unknown. That's why we all need to be educated, enlightened. We all need to be trained and go to re-education camps or whatever it is oh, yeah. to overcome these. I mean, all those verbiage, those that way of thinking, you know, comes from the construct. Well, that we he, look at certain behaviors that, that the Bible, for instance, says God's not happy with. And God even uses strong language for some of the behaviors. The, mm -hmm. the language is an abomination. That's a strong word. Um, Freud would call that simply a matter of personal taste. He said it was, uh, since there is no God, morals are simply aesthetics. It's whatever you like or dislike. And he gives an interesting example. He says, what's the difference between kissing a young woman's lips 
or is sharing her toothbrush. Now, with one we view with delight, mm -hmm. the kiss. The other one we would go, oh, I don't want to share a tooth toothbrush with somebody. And so he used that as an example of disgust that really is irrational and non-scientific because if you kiss the girl, you have the same germs as using her toothbrush, and yet one we think is sexy and attractive and mm -hmm. desirable, and the other we think is disgusting. Right. So he viewed, whatever, if, if I view a certain sexual expression as with disgust, it's my problem, it's cause, just because it's my personal taste. It has nothing to do with the innate rightness or wrongness. It's all about aesthetics. So everything is reduced to taste. Everything, everything is reduced to uh, aesthetics. And so today, if, counter, if we say, well, that's wrong, we yeah. say, that's wrong. You say, oh, well, that's just your personal taste. That's your that's your personal feeling. Yeah. I happen to find pleasure in it. I think it's great. Yeah. So everything is a matter of personal taste, which again, how do you live in a world where everything is a matter of or it's reduced to a matter of a step. It, it sound on the superficial level, it sounds loving or uh, tolerant. But if you dig into the the core root of that phil philosophy, it just calls chaos and destruction, which is what we have in the world today. <laughs> it's it's unlivable. Yeah. So so for instance, he says morality is simply a matter of cultural taste. It's about aesthetics. It's ne it's simply a necessary evil for social life to exist, mm -hmm. uh, which is a strange view of morality. Uh, they basically we're all we're all running around being neurotic because we can't really be the the sexual yeah. uh, predators that we want to be. <laughs> it's all social construct. Every everything's social construct and nothing's transcendent. Then then we're in big trouble. Yeah. That's all I guess. So let's, let's yeah. uh, finally here. I'm telling you we got left. Let's take the let's take the last jump. Okay. Because we move from the realm where the real you is not just free to be authentically you, but the real you is a sexual you. And so if the real you is, it cannot be separated from the sexual you, mm -hmm. the sexual self, then we must involve government. We must involve politics because now the role of government is to make sure by punishing people and by promoting certain things, make sure your sexual self can find public expression. So we wonder today, why is everything, well, like look at where all the battle lines are being fought yeah. um, in, in Washington. I mean, we're talking about transgenderizing the military. You know, we're talking about hate crimes. We're talking about, there's massive battles right now between religious liberty and sexual expression. Uh, not just religious liberty, a First Amendment, all First Amendment rights, free speech. Oh, absolutely. Free yeah. speech. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so the, why is it that everything politically is now sexual like how, how has sexuality become just one with politics yeah. i mean even the marriage debates right yeah. same-sex marriage uh what about the, what's going on right now with um with abortion uh, in america uh I, everything is sexual and this is freud i mean welcome again freud is still speaking to us uh, he's still in the halls of congress it, um, yeah it's interesting because people like oh the separation of church and state you know, basically separation of a fish, the official church government, I mean, official government with some type of religious institution, organized religious institution, which is what Thomas Jefferson referred to. It's not in the Constitution, it's in the letter from Thomas Jefferson. But that concept of separation of church and state is now in many ways violated because the church is, I mean, the government is adopting the church of Freud, Freud is adopting his uh, philosophical Okay, his religious views on the world and worldview, and basically imposing on the rest of the culture yeah. who might not subscribe to that religion, and that's the horror we're talking about today. That's why there's such chaos. And that's why we said before, you, everybody's religious. Everybody has a worldview. It's not just you Christian folks that are religious. Freudians are are incredibly religious in what they espouse to be reality and right. true. They're they're just they're just as opinionated about about life and reality as I mean we are. this idea that at, at the crew core nature of who we are is a is a sexual expression that sounds religious to me man that, that sounds a lot philosophical now this is not like hey i saw empirical data and even but, in, but that's that is the point though yeah. freud, freud shrouded all of his language and all of his theory you know where where, where rousseau was more romantic and right. more artistic freud came at it from a pseudo-scientific perspective right. so so he say, oh, when a, when a child uh, masturbates, uh, that is a very natural, normal thing, and it was all put under the the guise of scientific right. study as opposed to... It's like uh, Ken, Alfred Kinsey. It's the same it's shroud of all these scientific things. Again, and that's well, why science itself becomes so... Well, science so, becomes a religion. Becomes, yeah, 
it's a philosophy, a worldview, and becomes religious. We always said this, you know, whenever uh, a scientist is looking at data, it is the scientist with his own, his or her own worldview that's interpreting that data. Right. So even the interpretation of the data is not scientific, right. it's religious in nature, because it's going through somebody's worldview. So, um, yeah, it, it, and we'll probably get into this more in the next session as far as the politicization of this, because really it's a, a merger of Marxist ideology and Freudian ideology that we're facing in American culture today. It, it, it is the radical sexual revolution that is now being enforced through government power. Mm -hmm. You know, again, I used to I used to get amazed at how how our government agencies are are exploiting this uh, basically Freudian sexual uh, theory across the globe, pushing. Uh, uh, the LGBT, pushing uh, abortion on demand, pushing uh, contraceptives and safe sex and all that agenda, pushing this in all these countries that do not share those values. Many of them, again, coming from Christian roots. Why was America doing all of this? Well, it's because those in the elite group who buy into this kind of ideology are pushing this agenda. Yeah. Why the sexualization of our kids? Um, why sex had ever, you know, why sex and all the marketing? Yeah. Uh, this is all Freud screaming at us today uh, from, from his grave. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and it's just important for us to understand this. So um, anyway, next week we're going we're gonna to pick up a very, very important issue because on the heels of the destruction of all sexual morality, uh, it comes obviously an attack on the traditional family. Yeah. And uh, of course, Christians believe the traditional family is the cornerstone, the building block of healthy societies. Um, and why is it that people attack marriage between a man and a woman as a safe and healthy, and in fact, as the best place for raising the next generation of young people? Uh, we're going to see, again, a, a radical fusion between Marxist thought and between Freudian thought as it relates to sex uh, and, and really a movement in our culture today arguing from economic liberty or economic equality to really today we're finding a massive uh, expression of sexual expression uh, rooted in civil rights kind of language. Yep. Um, identity. And, uh, identity. Civil, yeah. civil rights identity, identity. Identity politics. Identity politics, yeah. Um, and it, it will help us understand why we're in the mess yeah. that we are um, politically. I, I just got one more point to add yeah. to, to this whole thing. Before I, I think a very simple way to think through this is what is the fruit of this just look i mean you don't have to even talk about sociological just look at the lives around you the people around you oh yeah uh what is the fruit of this indulgent into your sexual desire Ele elevate that as the number one desire the 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 the, the, the prime desire that leads all other desires <laughs> how is that how has that worked out for us as a culture yeah. how has that worked out for you maybe your friends or family or, or who people you know yeah. how has that worked out no. No, it's a good point. Hey, you look you look at the biblical conception of sexuality as a beautiful thing. It's a holy thing. Yeah. It's a it's something that is a sacred expression between a man and a woman who have made a covenant with each other for the for their lives. It, it is something powerful. So the Bible is certainly not anti sex, but just what you talked about. Look look at the tragic result of sexual expression outside of any moral boundaries. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> there's laws for all kinds of things, for money, for greed, you know, for, for sex, for for uh, power. I mean, all these different desires, and pick and choose. But whenever those desires are elevated beyond our prime desire, which ought all, all to be God, which we talked about this, right? Yeah. This is what happens. Yeah. So again, simply look at the fruit. Simply look at the results and say, well, and hey. I've, you and I both taught classes on philosophy and Christian thought. You can go back and look at the philosophers used to ask the question, what is the best life or what is the good life? Yeah. You know, what does that look like? And you go all the way back to like Aristotle. He, he believed that the virtuous person was the, the good life, the person who lived by virtue. Uh, you, you go back to, again, Christian philosophers, and they'd say, you know, the good life is a life that is a life pleasing to God. Yeah. Uh, and that produces harmony with God, harmony with people. And then we've, we, we've gone all the way down to where now simply a, a base lust, a, a desire for sexual, you know, satisfaction, yeah. uh, you know, uh, I think of the Rolling Stones, I can't get no satisfaction, you know, uh, so much of the music today, it's all, of, it's not about love, it's about just raw 
sexual desire. And it's, it's ugly, it's crude, it's perverted, it's callous, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's just gross. And where, where is the place for pleasure or happiness that comes from self-sacrifice? Because there's, there's a deep sense of like, why would soldiers go to war then? If they're deep into, their deepest desire is sexual fulfillment. That's who they are. You tell them that's who they are. Why would you go to war and protect your country? Lay your life down to protect your country. Why would anyone do that? Why would some business owner... What pleasure is there? In, what pleasure yeah. is in, in sacrificing himself? Why would a business owner work hard so that he can provide for his community? So he can serve and build infrastructure versus just hey, collecting wealth and become greedy and, and satisfy his appetites? Why should anyone be motivated to do any of those things? virtuous things that we often criticize people for when the philosophy we're putting on people is really at the root core who you are is expression of this carnal desire that's really about you it, it, it's we're, we're throwing paradoxes left and right and we're wondering why we have no we don't have scrupulous business guys or we don't have virtuous people who lay their lives down you know <laughs> so but, it's, 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 it doesn't make sense to me the, the proof is in the pudding you know a worldview that is true will produce amazing fruit uh, lasting fruit, uh, beauty, goodness, virtue, yeah. uh, blessing, uh, satisfaction. A, a worldview that's not rooted in truth is going to lead to disastrous results. And and wherever Freud and the Playboy lifestyle is is lived out, with the one night stands, the breaking of marital covenant, uh, raw sexual pleasure, you know that has a way of consuming a person. It leads to bondage. It leads. It does not lead to liberty. Uh, and so anyway, but, but I, I, this has been very helpful for me because all of a sudden I get why, why people with PhDs are pushing sex education all the way down into preschool. Like what, what kind of perverted thought is that? Well, I understand now it's, it's a perverted guy named Sigmund Freud who rejected God and who lived, who lived for his penis. All right. That, that's what happens. When you, and I, I shared Sunday, you know, I didn't use this language because there were children present, but you are, you, you are more than your penis, which is really good news if you're a guy. Uh, so act like it, live like it. Uh, and uh, and don't be controlled by your sexual desires and, and pleasure. There are greater desires. There's so much greater desires than that. So 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 we'll pick up this yeah. next week when we get into identity politics and why sex and politics are now merged together in America, uh, and we have to figure out how to deal with it and how to combat it. So hope you'll join us next week. Until then, have an amazing week. Let's live for the glory of God and maximum pleasure in Christ. <laughs> <laughs>